Lynn Leggett. Thank you so much for joining Zen One Podcast. Thank you so much for inviting me, Tiger. I appreciate it. Well, you've got a subject that we can't avoid, and I'd like to start there. Why do you think people burn out? Oh, wow. Okay. Well, I mean, burnout, that's a heavy one to answer right off, right out the gate. Um, burnout is a little different because I think people need to understand, are they overstressed or are they actually burning out? Because they're two entirely different things. And, and what I find when I coach individuals on burnout is that they're overstressed. Um, they think they're burned out because they don't see any alternatives. So let me give you like a, a 10,000 foot different level of looking at it. When somebody is overstressed, they still feel like they can accomplish what they need to accomplish if they just had a little more time. So the willingness to continue working, you know, to, to hit hard at it, all of that, that's still there. If they are burned out, they almost want to stay in a fetal position all day long. They don't want to get out of bed. They don't think about work. They don't care, you know, all of those things. So they're entirely different different things. So I find when people use those words interchangeably and they really shouldn't, because if you do have burnout, you, you don't, you're not, you're not even showing up at the office. And if you are, it's obvious physically looking at you that you should not be there. So what was the first one? Burnout versus what? Just to make sure I got it right. Burnout versus um, being overstressed. So stress versus burnout. Big difference between the two. Right. And stress is kind of good, right? Isn't it? Like we need a little bit of stress in life. That's where we grow. That's where we get to the next level. That's where our body, our mind is trying to fight with us and say, look, we're in the wrong path. Like we, we got to get, we got to get to the next level. We got to get to the next lane. Isn't it? Stress. And we cannot really function in our world without stress. But what happens is stress, the body will take on stress and it, and it needs to complete a stress cycle and then get rid of it. If, our, if we continue to get stress, 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 and we have no alleviation of the stress and everybody's different, then that's when the problems start to arise. That's when you start to see health problems like stomach ulcers, um, they catch colds more easily. Um, you know, they're catching colds and especially, you know, during COVID, that was a really big deal. They're not sleeping. They've got upset stomachs. They've got headaches. I mean, it, all kinds of different things. Every individual is different with how their body responds to stress, high blood pressure, big thing with that. Uh, so a little bit of stress is good, but we need to learn how to deal with it. And some jobs are more stressful than others. So is that alleviation, what works for somebody and typically on average, 30 minutes of physical activity a day is going to help you with that. But if you don't get that, it's 30 minutes of what works for you. Um, and, and again, everybody's different when it comes to that. This is so interesting. You said you need to complete the stress cycle and kind of get rid of it. What do you mean by that? Can you expand on it? The stress cycle is something, if anybody took psychology in college, they'll understand when you say, okay, psychologists are great or saying a tiger is attacking you. So everything is viewed as the tiger. But going through the stress cycle of, okay, hormones are released when your body is facing stress. And then once you are safe and your body realizes the tiger is no longer coming after me, then other hormones are being released to calm that down. And then you come back to a point of saying, okay, whatever you were doing before you thought the tiger was attacking, now you're back to home base, if you will, and everything is okay. The problem is the human body, when it has that many hormones being released for many different functions, it gets overloaded. And that's when I say, if you complete the stress cycle, that's where the problems are going to arise if the stress is layered if it's layered on and on and on and on and there is no break. That's when things start to happen and shift focus into if you're going to be on the on what I call the burnout spectrum. How bad is it? Where is it? You know, there's so many different things that are related to that. Um, we, we don't even have enough time to cover that whole subject, but it's there's a lot that needs to be unpacked on that. But I think most people need to realize if you're stressed, then that's one thing. If you are way, if it's affecting your daily life and you don't even want to get out of bed, it's not necessarily depression, although that is a part of it, 
but a lot of it is going to be within that burnout category and how your body is relating to that stress. But that's, it's not the day-to-day stress that I'm talking about. Yeah, I think my Wi-Fi is a little bit behind, but I want to jump on this too. So can you, Lynn, can you walk us through examples? Let's just take an, like a normal dental practice, a dentist. Like what is, can you give us an example of what is stress and what is burnout? Like let's pick a name like Dr. Awesome with, you know, a practice somewhere in North Carolina. I don't know. Like let's just, let's just play with that and so that we can try to see a side-by-side comparison. Okay. So I'm going to take the role as a dentist. That's the easiest way to, to relate this. Um, on the stress category, it may be, okay, really hard case. Maybe they didn't prepare clinically as much as they should have, but the op is their happy place. So they can sort of cover up, if you will, anything happening in the operatory. Um, the stress is maybe they had a fight with their, with their spouse before they came into work. Maybe somebody is late to huddle. But this is, you know, an eight o'clock patient, they sit down, they do the clinical work, maybe um, they did not pay as much as they should have, and they've already been checked out. So let's make the example real. Maybe the team didn't um, cover all their bases like they should have, and the patient left, and there's still a portion that's being owed. And the doctor just wants to go back in their office and just chill for a moment, because that's a lot, especially if it's like, say, it's multiple implants or something like that. Let's go a heavy, you know, heavy mm-hmm. you know, production codes, heavy production. That's something that that's just the morning. And they could have so many other things happening during the day. Burnout would be they've already faced fights at home. It's another day of they don't, the assistant they wanted to have stay with them left. They're hiring an assistant. Maybe the office manager and the doctor has some conflict. Maybe the rest of the team has conflict. The doctor's worried from a business owner standpoint because doctors always wear many hats. It's not just clinician. And that's the one thing that a lot of people forget. Um, You and I don't forget that, but a lot of team members will forget that. So there's so many things going on in their head that maybe the team doesn't understand. And it's just one more thing, one more thing. Um, Let's say we add on to that, that there is a aging parent and you don't know how you're going to handle things. Because if we're going to keep the example real, let's keep it all real. Um, You've got that in the mix. And then you show up to do the, the major production with the multiple implants. And the case just is not working. You cannot get, you know, the screw where you want it to go. The lab screwed up, whatever the case may be. All of these things are just hitting, hitting, hitting. And then the doctor's like, why did I get out of bed? Why don't I just sell my my practice? Why am I dealing with this? So these thoughts start going into their head and they're just like, "I, I have had enough of this. And you have so many days like that that's when things are really going to get heavy emotionally and psychologically very quick. So what's the solution? I'll, I'll, t- I'll share with you, Tiger, and, and your audience. Yeah. I personally have had two conversations where I did not work with these dentists, but when I answered the phone, they were both very similar. Um, and they said the key words of my gun is right beside me. I don't feel like my, my wife understands where I'm coming from and I'm just ready to end it. I have received two of those phone calls and they have how recently one was um, two years ago and the other one was about six months ago. Wow. And they, I've never worked with them, but they know me from social media and they follow me and they know I talk about burnout and I speak on burnout. And that was one of the things that that gets your attention really fast. Now there were a lot of different things going on, but when I get a phone call like that out of the blue, I'm, I'm, I'm jumping on that. So what do you and, do? Oh, well, one of them needed help immediately. So I needed to have some intervention with 911 of, about getting them help. Um, there, the other one we, I helped with him with his, with his therapist. And then I worked with him on his practice from a different standpoint. So it, it, both, both of the doctors are safe. Both of them are doing well, um, physically and mentally, but that, you know, people use, again, When you talk about burnout versus stress, they are entirely different. And a lot of times we'll just use words interchangeably. And those are two words that we should not use interchangeably. 
where would the word depression feel into like these two burnout and stress like is it on its own category or i think there's a component of clinical depression within burnout for sure um, but you don't have to have clinical depression and be stressed i don't i don't think one does not go with the other and sometimes with burnout there is no depression with that it just depends on how long have they been going on with those feelings you know, with what's happening within their particular um, situation. But there is, if I can, there's a silver lining. And I don't know if you, if you want to switch to being positive because being a coach, I'll, I'll let you stay in the negative for a little bit, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to raise you up into the positive. You can prevent burnout in a lot of different ways. I wonder, this is, here's where my mind is going. I wonder when doctors are like throwing the white flag and say, I'm done with this. What is it? Is it mostly stress and they don't know how to deal with it? Is it burnout or is it depression? I'm going to tell you it is not knowing how to solve the problem because they weren't taught this in dental school. They're not sure where the resources are to be able to help them. And sometimes it's easier to just say what, what frustrates them is not doing the clinical dentistry. What frustrates them is all of the non-clinical stuff, the business owner stuff. And sometimes that's when they're just like, I'm done because they don't want to deal with the hiring. They don't want to deal with the turnover. They don't want to deal with the other things. That's the stress inducing stuff to most dentists because it's non-clinical. And, you know, they had their opportunity to work for somebody else, but there's a reason if they own their own practice that they want to work for themselves. That's what I typically see. And to me, it seems like a lot of cases, again, I, there are some really bad cases that you described, but I think it's like majority, maybe 80% is just people stressed and they don't know how to deal with stress. Mm -hmm. And I also think the word stress is a little bit overplayed. You know, it's okay to say I'm tired, right? But to oh, say I'm stressed, maybe it's a little bit too much. Right now, like we're we're all like running around and trying to do things. And and again, maybe it's a society where we at as far as the society that the word stress and even depressed, like now overused. Like kids say I'm depressed. Like really? Yeah. So I don't I don't know. Like, and I feel like I think people can deal with it. I think burnout and depression is very, very different from stress and tired mm -hmm. and just mundane day to day workload that's Kind of like, you know, you just got to deal with it. There is a difference between, I think now, you know, ever since COVID, we've been talking about boundaries. And I think that's one thing that people need to realize. They don't have to do everything at every point, at every, at every turn. You know, you don't have to do everything. The problem is people, there are a lot of people pleasers. And those are the ones that have trouble saying no. And once somebody gets comfortable saying, you know what? Maybe in the future, but right now, I'm just not able to take on that project or, or whatever the case may be. Now is not really a good time, but maybe we can talk about this in the future. It's okay to say things like that. But, you know, as a working parent, they're, hit, they're getting hit with all different things all day long. And, and let's not forget, being a doctor, you're transitioning all day long between now I'm in the op, now I'm in hygiene, now I'm going back to this patient. So it's this ping pong kind of thing. And then you start getting the business owner thoughts involved. And now you've got, seems like a bunch of circus, a bunch of balls in the air in your head. You're like, how am I juggling all of this? And when the juggling gets too hard, that's when you start thinking about how can I make this easier in my life? What about the team members? Have you had anything similar with team members? I have a lot of team members that are that have burned out and gotten out of dentistry. I think a lot of people realized, uh, especially um, during COVID and right after COVID, they realized this is just not my jam anymore, and they wanted to get out of the industry. And I think that's one of the reasons why we're facing the shortages that we are with the um, highly skilled team members that we used to have. And we just were all competing for a much smaller pool of candidates that are able to do the job. And then we start talking about all of the other things that just because they can do the job, we really don't want that particular individual on our team, but yet we feel forced to do something that, you know, that square peg is not fitting in the round hole in my office, but I just feel like I have to have this person. And then there's your, there's your toxic person that's going to bring everybody down. Yeah. And, and 
to be fair, I don't think people. I generally think people are not born toxic. I, I don't think, think they're so either. usually made toxic in the wrong workplace when they are trying to be squeezed into the square hole as a round pig, right? Like using the, the same analogy to make it clear. Like, I think uh, Malika and I, we did a podcast recently and we talked about this a lot. I mean, we, we talked about this on a podcast that even the word leadership, I hear it all the time. I asked the doctor, so what do you want from your team? I want them to step up. I want them to be the leaders. Even dental assistants, like, you want a sterilization tech to be a leader in the office? Like, or let's define what the leadership is in your mind and let's call it something else because I feel like the word leadership is being put on people without explaining what that means, thinking that they know what that means. And it's just like overloading for I'm a leader now. And so I think team members are pretty stressed and maybe even burned out too. Oh, they absolutely are. I mean, I, I have team, I, I work with team members as well as dentists, as well as some dental sales reps. They're, they're all the time going, hey, you know, I need to talk to you. I need to do your coaching program. But going, going back to the leadership, you're, you're absolutely right, because leadership means something. Leadership is a word. It's a trigger word for a lot of dentists because they don't know what that means to them. And they may not know what it means to others. That's why I always like to use, you know, sports analogies because it gives people definition and boundaries. And dentists or doctors love to have those because that's what they're used to. They work well under those set of circumstances. So that's why I call the doctor, especially in a private practice, the doctor is the head coach. And if you can start looking at your practice through the lens of a head coach all of the non-clinical stuff like leadership starts to fall into categories and boundaries and, and a set game plan that I can help them create that it's not overwhelming. It's something that, okay, I can make this work because they need a plan. They've already got the plan on the clinical side because they already know the procedures. I start from A to Z and this is what I do. It's having the same thing for the non-clinical that they need help with. Because that's how I, I love to teach leadership using the coaching method because it uses and it takes advantage of things that dentists are already doing now, education and encouragement. Because I don't want somebody to create a whole new thing and then everybody's learning something new. Let's make something more comfortable. Let's take the obstacles away to where it makes them more comfortable right off the, right off the, at the beginning. And that's what I think teaching leadership using the coaching method does. Interesting. What do you think makes team members burn out? If we take an uh, average dental practice and especially those that left the profession, what, what triggered it? Well, let me start. Well, the first thing I'm going to say is culture. There's several things I can do to answer that question, but I am to this point in my career, I'm the only one that actually defines culture as what is acceptable or unacceptable when it comes to human behavior. Because at its essence and its core, that is what upsets people is, is human behavior. But what happens is we'll hire people and not ask or find out about the culture that we're trying to build in our practice. Sometimes doctors have no idea what their team thinks is acceptable or unacceptable. And that's where the conflict comes in. So when you ask about team members actually burning out, they don't understand their expectations. And if they're new to the practice, no one has talked about this with them at all because there has been no planning. It's like everybody wants to win, but very few people are prepared to do the work it takes to win. And that's what I'm talking about. You've got to create your game plan because if you don't have that, then you're aimless. You're just doing things because you've always done it that way. And then you've got that revolving door of having turnover with different team members. And I think the, the break that, back to your original question about during COVID people leaving the industry, that gave people a lot of opportunity and time to sit back and think, what is most important to me? Because Right now, it's easy Monday morning quarterbacking and going back and saying we should have done X, Y, Z. But in the moment, people were thinking, okay, if I have, you know, elderly parents and what, what's going to happen to them? I have kids that are school age. What's going to happen to them? The financial insecurity of what's going to happen to my job. And then, then you start seeing people work from home. 
have more flexibility, all of these things people started thinking about going, you know what, I have this skill set and this particular skill set can be used in a lot of different industries. If, if things were not running smoothly in practices before COVID, uh, that's when I think a lot of team members were saying, you know what, I, I'm, life is too short. I don't want to deal with this anymore. And they left the industry. So do you think culture is the main reason? Yeah. Culture, lack of leadership, um, because dentists just don't know how to lead. Uh, and, and something else I'll, I'll throw in there. I think a lot of people think about attitude and mindset. I will tell you, I think mindset is intentional and attitude can fluctuate with emotion and environment. And what happens is when we have a group of people together, and even though the dentist calls them a team, they, are they a team or are they employees? Because their human behavior will dictate totally different opposite behaviors. If you have a team, then you're not going to argue whose responsibility it is to do what, because everybody already understands their role. Everybody understands, hey, I, I'm there to help everybody. It, you're not going to hear, it's not my job, or I don't have to do that, that I'm not responsible for that. The, the heart is different when you are talking about a team member versus an employee, because there are tons of employees out there. And that's the issue. As long as you're hiring and you have that high turnover rate, you've got employees coming in and out. You're not taking the time to create a true team. And they're totally different. Using the sports analogy, you know, people build teams, right? There's a head coach, mm -hmm. there's a general manager. They do the draft. They bring the new people. But they also do, you know, off-season trading and stuff. I mean, it's such a cool analogy. I didn't think about it that way until you said that. <laughs> Because you can have like a head coach constantly thinking about the game, right? The plan, how are we going to win? What kind of team are we going to build? But then you have a general manager constantly thinking what kind of people we need. Like, okay, so if you need to put two hats at the same time and be the head coach and the general manager, but at least have those parameters knowing that you need to find, like how many times it happened that the teams bring the player and the player doesn't work out and they trade the player. Mm -hmm. Because again, the player is the player. You can catch the ball, throw the ball, right? It's not a problem. But is he going to be, or is she going to be a team player? That's the question. And it depends on your team and what's like, what, I guess the question is, I'm going to start rumbling. What is the document that's going to help a new employee to understand what kind of team she's getting into and set or, or even try it goes to get on the back path to of... the game plan that I help doctors create because that's what plan? they're lacking. They don't, they haven't sat, they haven't sat down and actually done the preparation to be able to have that plan. So when I say the game plan, well, let's start with most doctors have no idea it, and it's not written down and talked about their mission. And it's, and you know, it's just, it doesn't have to be complicated. It's just, why are you doing dentistry? What is it that you are doing? What are you offering that nobody else is offering? You know, understanding your competitive, competitive advantages versus other practices. But the vision is even more important because that's part of the culture and the core values, the way I do it with my, with my clients, because you need to know where you're going for everybody to be going the same direction. And it takes the leadership of the head coach or general manager or however you want to describe it to be able to bring people together and go, listen, this is the offensive set we're going to run in the defense if we're talking about basketball. And I, I believe in this, you know, are we going to do zone or man to man in certain circumstances? What I'm basically saying is everybody needs to be prepared for everything. Now I'll break down a practice even more than that, Tiger. I'll say, okay, practice time is when you're not seeing patients. Game time is when you are seeing patients, but doctors don't look at it like that because they want to do everything during game time. You cannot practice and the coach and the players cannot know what the goal is going to be and how they're going to adjust according to what's happening during the game if they don't have practice time. There's no way you're going to be successful if you don't take the time during practice time to, cre to roll through and role play all of those things that can possibly happen and know how you're going to adjust to that. Um, one of the things I like to use, because Dennis, you know, Sometimes they get it right off the bat and others, they'll sort of look at me and I'm like, all right, let's talk about this. Cause I used to be an EMT. If you have a medical emergency in your practice, you should practice 
Who is calling 911? Who's grabbing the kit? Who is doing what specific task at what point is all of this going to happen? You do not want to practice that when you have a medical emergency in your chair, but that happens a lot because they haven't pre planned or practice what's going to happen when certain things happen. Your best teams are already going to know automatically who's going to do what, when is it going to happen, and when you practice, I, and I do this with clients on site, I'll purposely take key, person, key team members out of the equation and go, now what? Who's doing what? Because if somebody's on vacation, if somebody's sick, you have to take all of those possibilities into account and know how you're going to handle that emergency. That may be the easiest way for, for dentists to understand exactly what I'm talking about. It's such a good point. It's like before the cloud, there were so many practice management softwares running on the servers and everybody thought they have backups, right? Until something <laughs> happened and oops, they actually don't have backups. And part of what you're talking about is, is very important to even check the backups and maybe on a monthly basis, make sure that somebody's checking the backups and you're trying to upload them back and recover and see if it's working or not. But I mean, I'm from the tech world, so I can, that's the example that I can relate to what you just said. Yeah, absolutely. And that, because it's too late at that point, if the backup didn't work, now what? Yeah, not fun. No. Um, what do you do? What do you do when somebody says they're like, I, I don't want to stay on this for too long, but I, I, I wanted to ask this question. I kind of went in a different direction, but I want to circle back and then move forward. On the burnout, when you feel that somebody is burnout, when you see that, what are the first two to three steps that you give them? Like what, what goes in there to help them get out of it? Well, you need, you should be able to see if, if you're coaching your team, let's go for the most positive example here. If you're coaching your team, like you should be as the head coach, as the dentist, you should see that somebody's behavior is changing in front of you. You should have the warning signs in front of you that somebody, um, you know, they could be missing work a lot more frequently. They could be getting sick quicker. They could just look ragged. A lot of it is, is physical being able, cause you, you should know your people. Um, you should know your team. There are warning signs all over the place like these that you should be able to see and observe, but it's a lot of people like to put their head, stick their head in the sand, you know, nothing to see here. Everything's fine. No, when it comes to burnout and, and mental health like that, it's not okay to put your head in the sand. When they've gotten to burnout, then you're going to see somebody has a really short fuse and people will start distancing themselves away from that because they're not sure or which reaction you're going to have when you talk to somebody. That's why you need to always have open communication and coaching just gives, in my opinion, the best, the best plan for that. Um, because it already has built in the boundaries, built in different ways of being able to look at that. So th the biggest thing you're going to look at is physical, but also, you know, how do they react and how different, how different is their behavior versus how it used to be? That's a big tell. A lot of doctors, here's the pushback. A lot of doctors will say, but Lynn, I have an open door policy. They can talk to me anytime. We eat lunch together. How much more can I do? They know when something is wrong and that's not enough because if they can see that there is a problem with their team member, then pull them aside. Because if they do have an open door policy, then it should be open enough to say, hey, pull the person in your office and say, I've noticed that. And then talk to them. You know, I've noticed that you look like you're a little stressed. What's going on? You know, how can I help? It's not defensive as far as, hey, I've noticed you're not doing your job like you once did. It, the la that's the last thing you need to tell anybody that's suffering from something like that. It's, I'm concerned about you. Help me understand. Help me help you. What's going on? And, you know, they have to be comfortable enough to be able to share that with you. Um, and if they don't, you can't force somebody to tell you what's going on because everybody has life outside of the practice. Um, but, you know, if you're really noticing that something's going on, your team needs help or that team member needs help. Okay, so you noticed, then what? You talk then to the person, that, and then what? 
and and after you've talked with that person say okay how can i help you because some people are open to having help some of them aren't and if you can if they if they continue to push back and say no i'm fine nothing to see here and you still notice that a week later two weeks later then it's time to say you know what i'm now concerned about you and i want to get you some help and i I will gladly work. I work with team members now that doctors call me and say, Hey, I'm worried about the mental health of my team. I want you to work with everybody. And that's why I create one of the reasons why I created my coaching program. But if it's something that needs immediate intervention, then there are, I mean, if you think they're suicidal, that's a completely different thing, yeah. but chance let's, let's not even think that let's, let's just say that they need some help. It could be something as simple as, I'm caring for, you know, a family member that's going through cancer treatments, maybe a meal or, you know, Uber eats being sent to the house or a gift card or something is all they need to get them over the hump. And for them to just be able to rest, it could be something like hiring a babysitter. I mean, you don't know the situations that are happening that they are losing sleep. Sleep is so important and, you know, taking care of ourselves, but, and I'm not talking about manicures when everybody has says self care. I mean, much more basic things. Like if you're leaving work and you're not going to bed till 2 AM and you have to be up at six o'clock or earlier the next day, that's going to wear on anybody. Find out the core reason why that's happening and be creative in your problem solving to see how you can help. It could be something as simple as that, or, you know, if they need to take a leave of absence for a while, if that's something that you want to do as the business owner to be able to say, hey, you, you need time to be able to figure that out. Um, it, it comes in a lot of different forms. The only limitation is how creative you are with your thinking. That's the problem. I think where I see the pushback might come from is especially with the shortages right now. Like, I don't know. And again, I hope I'm wrong. I just feel like some doctors would be closing their eyes and a lot of times not on purpose, just not seeing it, genuinely not seeing, being themselves overloaded and saying, well, I don't know if I can deal with what the response is going to be. I'm going to sit down and talk. The response is going to be something that I don't know how to handle at the moment myself. Like the person says, I need a time off. What am I going to do? Reschedule patients? Like, how am I going to deal with this? Maybe I'd much rather have a person in the chair. Like, I'm, I'm trying to see from both sides, like, and, and I'm sure you've been asked these same things. Like, I'm, I'm curious, like, what would the answer be? How would you handle that? Well, I think the first thing is what you just came by asking me that question. You came from a point of fear. I don't know because the dentist is so overwhelmed. I'm scared. I don't know what they're going to say. Well, you need to find out or or they're going to leave you potentially and, and not know that you care. This is how you start building that. I mean, I'm, I'm assuming there's trust already between the team and the doctor to be able to get to this point. If there isn't, then you're not really going to know what's causing the problem. Yeah. I mean, let's just 100%. be honest. They won't share that yep. with you. But if there's trust back and forth, it's going to be, listen, I legitimately care for you. I want to make sure you're okay. How, what's going on? How can I help? And, and it's okay to say, you know what? I don't have an answer right now. I need to think about it, but let's continue talking about this and see how I can help you. And you don't have to have the answer immediately. It's okay. And I know doctors are so used to having that immediate answer. It is all right to say, wow, I didn't, I didn't know how you were going to answer the question, but I care. So I wanted to ask, let me think about it. And I think most doctors, when you, they allow themselves to t the time to actually think about it, they'll come up with a great answer and then they can start helping their team member, not just be afraid to ask the question. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. So they, they asking for time, being candid, asking for time just to wrap up there and not feeling pressure to resolve the issue on the spot, but knowing that, you know, it really matters to be human. Mm -hmm. Therefore, you ask the question, you listen. I think it's also important in the moment not to be defensive and say, well, Absolutely. you know, but you don't know what I'm going through, right? Like, oh, yeah, this is not a this is not a comparison yes. conversation. This is you're listening because you care and and you've already admitted 
I may not have the answer right now, and that's okay. They're not expecting you to have the answer immediately because if you do, then they should have already solved it on their own. It, it's more than likely not going to have an answer right off the bat. But the fact that you're showing that you care, that's, that's your goal at that moment is to show that you care. You have to ask the question and then deal with, okay, I'm not sure what the answer is, but let's continue talking about it. Let's see if between the two of us, let's talk to some people. Let's see if we can find some sort of resolution, some sort of help or assistance to get you through this, whatever this may be. And just that show of care that's going to separate you as a business owner from everybody else because that's your team. And you're, you're openly seeing somebody that's hurting. Like you said, be human. Be human first. You can figure out the rest as you go. Lynn. What are your thoughts on being true to your personality? So, and I'll elaborate on this. There are some doctors that are just, they can connect with people. You've been to these offices, right? When they flow through the hallway and it's, you know, it's just magical and it's natural. They're connecting with their team members and it doesn't matter. It's a he or she, like we've seen, like these doctors, they know how to handle it. It's like almost they're born that way. Mm -hmm. And you've seen some doctors that don't have it. They just simply don't. And any time they, they go to the conference to a mastermind and they're told that you need to be the leader of the practice, you need to stand up and do the morning huddles. I watch some people and I'm like, you should delegate it. Let someone else do it. What's the right way? How to find the balance? I don't know if I'm I clear think, on the question. You are. You are. And, and if I'm off on the answer, let me know. But I think I know where you're going with this. There is a natural inclination for some to be a people person and to just, there's joy all around them kind of thing. And then there are others that have to work at it. So the ones that have to work at it, that's why I always go back to the coaching philosophy or the sports philosophy. If you can see it through the lens of that, then it takes the angst away of how do I deal with something as obscure as leadership? How do I deal with things like that? Or, or people, how do I deal with people when I'm getting hit with all these different personality types and I don't even like to deal with, with most of them. So now I have all of this to deal with. That's right there is the crux of the problem with Dennis being leaders and owners of their own practice. Cause that's the stuff they hate. They absolutely detest it because it is not in the operatory and that's their happy place. Um, when it comes to working with people like that, they need a plan. What happens is that they don't have a plan, then they feel lost. They're not anchored to anything. They need the anchor so that they feel comfortable. That's why when I use the sports analogies, that anchors them. And they're like, I never thought about my team that way. Well, if you call them a team, then you're the coach. If you're, you know, if that's your situation. Now, if you think they're employees, then they're going to act like employees. And if you call them a staff, I, I wouldn't work for anybody that called me staff. That's not respectful. Um, but again, the words we use have meaning. Let's create Every season, I create a team from individuals. I've done it for over 30 years in the business world and on the basketball court. So to me, it's very, it's second nature to me. That's why I like to teach it. It's definitely a teachable skill that I can teach others. I want you to feel comfortable doing the non-clinical things in your practice. That's the fun part about what I get to do is helping them in an area that they're not comfortable with and getting them to go, oh yeah, that wasn't so hard. Like, Review time. If you're coaching your team like you should be, they know where they stand. They know their strengths and weaknesses. They know what to be working on because it's, it's conversation during the whole day. It's not once a year. People should know where, you stand, where they stand with you. They should know the expectations. You know, all of these things, we, we can wrap it up in a pretty bow within the coaching world, but it's hard because the, the golden nugget is in the planning. If you don't plan, then you're not going to be successful. You're not going to have the anchor and you're going to feel lost. And that's why dentists are not happy about being business owners. Interesting. Even going back to the sports analogy, I mean, people watch the tape. Like, again, I'm a mm -hmm. big hockey guy. The next day, the, everybody's watching tape. You know, how many times in dental office, a doctor with the dental assistant will watch the tape of the day before 
where the procedure went not so well and the assistant needed to get up and run to get an instrument, like maybe didn't pass the right instrument. Like, hey, in this case, maybe if I do this, you do that, like communicating through and using the specific stuff. Like, it's so cool. It's interesting. And and so that you make an excellent point because obviously we're not taping people around us and what happens in the op. But they have but camera that's in something... every op. Every office <laughs> you... is cameras left and right now. Well, and so you have to ask yourself, why is that being done? And in certain states, you got to let everybody know that. Anyway, that's that's a different topic. Yeah. Um, but But talking, I mean, not literally watching the tape as much as it is, hey, let's recap what went well, what didn't go so well, how can we do better? And it's not accusatory. It's just the tighter you can work with your team. And that's just in the back. Same thing happens in the front. If things weren't communicated well, if somebody said no to the treatment plan, if, you know, if you can you can break it down into a lot of different areas. How can we plan to make it better for our patients? If you are always focused on the patient, you cannot go wrong. It's always the patient has to be in the center of everything that we do. I think I'm losing you. I know. I'm just thinking about my Wi-Fi. I'm ready to kill this router that I have. Oh, okay. Yeah. So I want to talk about vision and mission. Okay. Why do you think it's getting neglected? Lynn? Can you hear me? I can now. You asked okay. me something about vision and mission and then you cut out. Yeah. Why is it being neglected? Because they, okay. I think most people hear those and they think, great, that's a business thing from the 1980s. And they're right. But it is very applicable for today. And if you do it with the updated way, like I like to do it with my patient, with my clients, it is a guide to be able to say, okay, this is what we believe. This is how we set out to help our patients. Again, it's patient centric. And it's the planning, it's part of the planning game plan, if you will. The overall practice game plan has to have those together because the problem is if the team doesn't understand the mission, okay, they don't know how you're going to play the game. They don't know if they win or lose. They don't know because there is no school scoreboard in dentistry. It's not as easy as a basketball game or any other sports to see the scoreboard. So how do we know if we're doing a good job or not? That's when, when things get wonky when, is when, when team members don't have an anchor. Are we doing well? Are we doing poorly? They don't know. So part of all of doing the mission and the vision is to be able to say, hey, this is the goal that I have for my practice. This is what I want to attain. These are our core values. Now, a lot of those you need to put together with the team because then you get the team buy-in. And the team can't say, hey, you didn't ask my opinion because the doctor, it's not run by eat it. It's not a dictatorship. And that's the difference. In 2024, well, all right, back in the 80s and 90s, you could have run a dental practice with being the dictator. But plenty were done that way and they were very successful back then. You cannot do that in 2024 and be successful. You just can't because you've got too many generations working together within the practice and you're going to, at some point, not be able to hire the younger, talented, you know, dental people in our industry if that's what you're doing, because no one's going to put up with that. Now, if you create a team atmosphere, which is what good coaches do, I'm just talking about good coaches. I'm not talking about great coaches. I'm just talking about a good coach. We're not even, we're not even going up higher and higher. Oh. Oh, a good God. coach is going, to, is going to be able to plan all of these things out. And have the fundamentals of this is where we are. This is where I want to get to. How do you guys think we can get there? Ask the team for buy-in because once their opinion is being asked and being taken into consideration, then they got skin in the game. Then, then they understand, okay, this is how it relates. Now, I'm a big, big advocate for understanding for everybody on the team to understand everybody's individual roles and responsibilities and how it relates to the team and the practice. Because if I don't know what Susie's doing over there and Susie doesn't know what I'm doing, then there's a problem because that's only going to help us become stronger teammates when I truly understand what she's trying to do. And oh, by the way, I think everybody needs to be responsible for a primary task 
but also secondary task because if somebody's out of the office, it still needs to get done. So when, when I work with practices, it's okay. This is your primary responsibility, but here your secondary that you need to know. You just don't do it on a regular basis because you're responsible for it when somebody else is out. It ha that has to happen with everything else within the practice. Uh, why do you think it has a, such a bad rep though? Like, I think genuinely with most offices, if you say, what's your vision and, and the mission statement, they'll be like, let's get to work. Because they think it's fluffy and they think that it doesn't mean anything. And that right there is the problem because that's what's separating the practices that are able to keep a true team and those that have a revolving door with hiring. Because when you create a true team and you have those foundational things together that you've created and you're working on your culture, again, what's acceptable behavior, what's unacceptable behavior, now you're now you are taking all of the individual threads and weaving them together into a cohesive thing that people, once you have it down, nobody's going to leave for 25 cents more an hour because they don't want to deal with the junk that's on the other side. The grass is not always greener. So when you have it done to where people have a predictable workflow for the day, they know what their day is going to be like. I can show up for huddle on time. I can leave on time. I can have a life outside of work. When you start having these things, that really is the overall goal of the business owner for that practice. That's what the head coach needs to be looking at. And that's the people part that's fuzzy to them because they think, well, they weren't taught that in dental school either. So they think all of this is fluffy. It's just as important as doing a crown and the steps that you were taught in dental school, all of this is just as important, or you're not going to succeed unless you have a strong team around you. You can't do it all. Yeah. Meaning you can't do it all by yourself is what I meant by that. And Lynn, I think to your point, just what you gave an example with crowns, I think the same is with mission and vision, right? It's not like you write it down once and you never talk about it. Maybe you start a morning exactly. huddle with it, right? So like, just like you do the crowns and feelings and if you're specialist, you do your procedures, but same with mission and vision. I remember the first time we had to write, um, I think it's called handbook, but I think we called it something else internally for our team. It was a 52 page long document, right? Mm -hmm. That we wanted to make sure we have the document when anybody joins, they know exactly what they're getting themselves into. And we actually try to even like make it sound even worse than it is to, so like people you know don't have their own perceptions but what's interesting is i looked at it yesterday and we had six or seven revisions in the last four mm -hmm. years just you constantly going back and i was laughing at some of the stuff i put in a, a there's a section working with tiger and literally right there it was the one paragraph i'm not going to say because i'm embarrassed but I have to take it out. I'm like, no, 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 no. I know exactly what happened. I know why I put it in. It's total garbage. It's out. Like, I don't need it there. And so just like doing reps, the same thing with the mission and vision, I guess, right? It is all related, but you've got to start somewhere. And you can't edit a document if you haven't started a document. But it's got to sure. it's got to breathe, like you said. It's going to change with, um, like handbooks are going to change depending on our state law. Same thing. Our culture is going to change because maybe, maybe our standards were set at at this level, but now we've gotten so much better that level is going up. So our expectations need to increase as well. It's it's not okay to accept subpar behavior, but when you have no measurement of behavior, what's par? What's subpar? I don't know. So those are the things that help you with all of the not easy to define things that happen in the non-clinical part of the practice. Part of the practice. Yeah. Yeah. That is so cool. Um, what do you think? And maybe these are some of my last questions just to make sure we stay um, on time. What do you think? Actually, let me go back. Great coach. Okay. What do you, how do you define a great coach? And what would that look like in dentistry? A great coach is one that a good coach, all right, good coach is what I've already described. You, you're still in the process of creating your team. You know, you're, you're creating that from employees. 
a great coach has already had the good team under them for several years. So their idea as the head coach, we're going to get more complicated with the plays we want to run. We're going to assume when people come onto our team, they can do certain things because we've already gotten a whole lot better about communication. And if you're offered a job to even become a member of our team, that means something. And here's the onboarding. And oh, by the way, when we interview and when we narrow down our, our candidates, and let's say it's between two people, here's what the practice stands for. Here's our mission. Here's our vision. Here's our culture. If this is something that is not aligned with your values, then we go no further because you're going to have to sign this document that you agree. And these are the rules of our team. And this is what you're going to need to do in anticipation of joining our team because we're, we're no longer going to allow subpar players here. I, it's not that you're looking for all starters because everybody has a role to play, but you need to understand that role. And you really don't have starter players on, in dental, just saying, you know, every, everybody starts because if they weren't important, then they wouldn't have their role. And there'll yeah. be more, more than five. That's why I say you're not going to have starters in case anybody, you know, wants yeah. to call me out on that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, but, but that's, that's the type of mentality that comes with it. Cause you're always encouraging. See, doctors already encourage their patients. Now they get to turn that inward and encourage the team. They got it in them. They just haven't seen it from that lens before. So they all have it in them and they already do education because they already teach their patients. Now let's teach our team. We teach people how to respond to us. It happens all the time. So if it goes back to culture, right? What's acceptable, what's unacceptable when it comes to human behavior, it all comes and is woven together that when we are a great coach, we don't have to worry about the little stuff anymore because that's already going to be taken care of. But I think it's very important for everybody to realize you've got to start somewhere and it's never too late. Please be encouraged that if all of this sounds exciting, it is exciting because it can be done. Now they're growing pains. I'm not going to blow smoke up anybody. It, that, it, it is what it is. But once you start getting used to it and once you get start really getting enthusiastic about it, then it, work's going to take on a different excitement. It's going to be it's going to be so wonderful to be able to look at people blossoming with their full potential in front of you. And that's what I love to do is bringing out everybody's full potential. Nothing hurts me more as a coach, whether sports or dental, to see the potential in somebody and they never live up to it. We're, and it's up to them if they want to live up to that potential or not. If we create the environment that they need and they get the support and they still don't do it, that's not on the doctor. That was picking the wrong team member for your team. They will leave on their own because they'll realize they can't keep up with everybody else. What do you think the doctor can do if they see that the team member is not living up to their expectations? That's when they have coaching conversations and they go, you know what? This, these are my expectations. And I know you're capable of doing it because you showed me boom, boom, boom and, and talk it out and say, have I confused you? Do you have all the information that you need? You know, where have I gone wrong explaining this to you? And then if they still, if they're still not performing up to their standards, because that's the accountability part. And as a coach, we use these words, we throw them around. But again, when I talk about feedback, when I talk about accountability, if you're the head coach or the office manager being the assistant coach of the team and having those conversations, hey, you know what? You're not doing the insurance verifications like you should. We're worried about our revenue cycle within the practice because this is related to this, 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 and so on. Then that's a conversation of, do I need to coach you? Do you need to learn something else? What can I do to help you within your position of the team? And people are either going to be inspired by that conversation or they're going to go, you know what, this just isn't the place for me. Okay. Sometimes you, you need, like you said, you need a trade. You need to be able to figure out who needs to be there and who doesn't. And that's okay. Don't let that fear hold anybody back. Because if you look at this from a fearful standpoint, that is what's holding your practice back. Wow. Lynn, there are so many golden nuggets on this podcast. I really appreciate you. And I want to ask how people can find you. Oh, well, I think one of the things people may be most interested in is going to my website because everything I've talked about is on my website. Um, and that's going to be found at victorydentalmanagement.com. 
I also have a newsletter called The Coach's Corner. You, you can subscribe to that on there or contact me um, on the web page as well. Or if you want to, if you know you want to go ahead and get in touch with me, send me an email at Lynn, L-Y-N-N-E, at VictoryDentalManagement.com. Do you mind if I share your email in the podcast notes? Absolutely. Please. Please. I want okay. to be here in case anybody needs any help. Yeah. So cool. Lynn, thank you so much. Again, I just want to be respectful to the time. I'm sure we'll do take two. But this was great. There are a lot of gold awesome. nuggets here. Well, thank you thank so you. much for the invitation. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Lynn.